Welcome everyone to the 30-minute Midas Touch from beautiful Dyersburg, Tennessee at the Herb Welsh Wrestleplex. Now, here is pound for pound and inch for inch, the best of the best in professional wrestling today. A wrestling genius worth his weight in gold. The Golden Boy, Greg Anthony. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 30-minute Midas Touch. I am your host, the golden boy, Greg Anthony, and with me as always is my co-host, the Marvel, Mark oh, Tipton. Oh, the Marvel. Very nice. Uh, I do appreciate the uh, the introductions each week, and the Marvel's very nice. I, I have long times been a fan of Marvel, because when you say Marvel, that implies comics to me, which, like many folks, I was a fan of for some time. Uh, and on this week's edition of the 30 minute Midas touch podcast, I would like to talk about something that, um, we have talked about in primarily a negative light. Uh, we have talked a lot about cinematic matches and the cinematic aspect that has, you know, kind of invaded professional wrestling. And I've, when you say that to me, I usually have a negative reaction as a member of the audience, you know, cause I think of, let's say sound effects of a freight train during the course of a match, that kind of thing, that jumps out to me. A sound effect like that is a negative, you know, but we want to try to come at it from a somewhat different point of view on this week's edition. Uh, We want to try to say, hey, what are some aspects of the movies or cinema that do in some ways translate and, you know, kind of benefit professional wrestling? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and like we said, we said it before on the podcast, um, wrestling has been so busy trying to be other things for the last 20 years or so, rather than just being great professional wrestling, that a lot of stuff has got um, convoluted and misunderstood. Um, yes, you know, um, wrestling is like music. Wrestling is like comic books. Wrestling is like movies. It's like a lot of things. But at the end of the day, it's still professional wrestling, and it needs to live, die, and breathe within the confines of that reality-based, sports-based world. You know, um, so yeah, with movies in general, there's a, there's a lot of great things we can pull from the movies. But it, once again, it has to be able to be translated to professional wrestling, and we're going to go over some instances of that and the, the hows and whys of why it does or does not work. All right, well. Um like I say, I, I do think you're coming at this from a perspective I have not considered. I'm, as a viewer, I get caught up in the, you know, the very obvious things. Uh, we see the types of matches the Hardys had and those sorts of things. And the, the what is it, the lake of, I can't remember, you know, bring you back to life. I can't remember it anyway. Reincarnation. Lake of reincarnation, I believe. And, of course, Smoke and Joe Frazier, the kangaroo. Those sorts of things. But, uh I take it you're talking about as far as and because professional wrestling is entertainment. Mm-hmm. And so what you're trying to say is you're trying to, in much the same way that movies try to involve their audience in the story that's being told, I take it you're saying you professional wrestling can, and when done well, does bring the audience in in a similar fashion. Yeah, like I've said before, to me, for me personally, professional wrestling is um, the most beautiful form of storytelling there is. You know, that's for me because I'm a professional wrestling fan. Do I like movies? Of course I love movies. Uh, But to me, professional wrestling is hands down the best because I've never had the visceral reactions that I've had (laughs) to professional wrestling. I've never had those for any other, to an extent, but not to the extent of what I've had for professional wrestling. Whether it be love, hate, indifference, whatever it may be. You know, I've always had a very strong reaction to professional wrestling. So when done correctly, yes, professional wrestling is meant to draw you in and meant, meant to have you engaged. And in, in, in we said it before, wrestling is the the ultimate fan participation thing. You know, I mean, if you go to a movie theater, you know, it's not really uh, of decor to, decorum to, to cheer or, or boo and stuff like that. But at wrestling, that's the norm. That's what we want, right? So, yeah, I, um, like I said, there's lots of elements in movies that – that do translate, but there's a lot that don't as well. You know, uh, like you said about the Braun Strowman freight train thing, that doesn't translate. You know, I'm sure that was a smart, that's a, that's one of those WWE television writer things like, oh yeah, that'd be, that'd be hilarious. 
It doesn't matter if it's hilarious. It's phony, right? And it's fake. And it reminds people that you're phony and you're fake. So why remind the audience audience of something like that? Well, I will try not to dwell on this example that I brought up too long. But I, I, when I hear it, it makes me think that it's almost a marketing thing. They have, when Braun comes out, you see the Strowman Express. And so, and... You know, so it's part of the kind of the brand they've created for him. So you include that in and say, hey, maybe it'll help sell an extra T-shirt or two or something like that. But one of the things that uh, comes through to me is you were talking about how, you know, that kind of takes away from the uh, reality-based aspect. Sometimes I wonder, do those who were involved in the creative portion, particularly of the WWE, and, well, we could be pointed at others as well, do they view it as reality based? No, I, I don't think they do, and I think that's actually part of the huge part of the problem. And like I said, re- as much as it's like wrestling is its own thing, so like it doesn't it doesn't resonate as well. You understand? Like wrestling, I, I said this before. We we went to a um, a Penn and Teller show in Vegas years ago, and Penn said something about magic that really pertained to wrestling too he said you know when people go to a movie or they go to a play or whatever they go willing and able to check their suspension of disbelief at the door and and accept whatever world no matter how far-fetched and whatever it is you know in front of them they're willing to accept it but when they go to a magic show and when they go to a wrestling show they walk in there with a chip on their shoulder because they're looking for oh there's a mirror behind that. Oh, there's a trap door. Oh, he didn't really hit him with a clothesline. Oh, those those guys are buddies. I saw them on the internet together. You see what I'm saying? They're, everyone's looking for the holes in our reality anyway. You know, so that's what I'm saying. Like, let, don't give them any holes. L- give them, like, I don't even like how nowadays it's a very common thing for us to know what wrestlers are dating who. Right, because to me that kills everything. If one guy's a bad guy and one girl's a baby face, then then it just d- destroys your entire dynamic, right? And then you have situations where you know, well, oh, they put him on Raw and she's on SmackDown. They must be trying to break them up. You know, who cares about that shit? You know what I mean? Like, you know, I shouldn't know that. You know what I mean? I, the same thing. Like, we've got into this where it's it's. We're athletes, but at the same time, we're these actors slash whatever. Like, um, not to spoil anybody, but, you know, on the NXT thing, the Gonzalez chick, the big six-foot-tall chick, she won, right. the, she won the NXT women's title, she, right? Yes. And uh, But then on all the social media, all the WWE social media, it's this big baby face thing. Like, her family's there, and they're hugging and crying. It's like, no, she's a heel. She has been a heel on your television for however many months now, and you've built her as this, and now you're giving her, you know, the baby. Right. Th- yeah. Yeah, they had her play out there, everyone, including, um, you know, Rhea, uh, Rhea Ripley, pardon me if I mispronounce it, who's involved in WrestleMania. They had her go through her as part of building her up and her credibility and making her a challenger. Um and I kind of want to play this. What I, I have something fresh in my mind that may be an example of this is uh, Bobby Lashley. As the WWE champion, he's on my mind. Uh, he, you know, was portrayed as a heel. He had a faction. He was there with MVP. Those people obviously interfered to help him win matches. He became the champion, you know, with the, with the aid of the Miz and, and very conniving and backstage kind of, maneuvering to kind of get his championship and then after doing all this that had me view him as a negative light when he became champion he was celebrated this was a man who had uh, you know waited 16 years for this opportunity and it was a great achievement a great accomplishment for him and it was but I did not expect to hear that portrayed that way on WWE television and programming this was an individual who had got it through you know unfair methods and I wanted to see him as that, but I don't see him portrayed as that. Yeah, you're, I mean, you're exactly right. I mean, that's and that's part of the problem that we're talking about is um, it's like it's almost like an Oscar to them instead of like an actual like you know competition championship. You know, so to them it's like an Oscar. So you know, it's like Cuba Gooden Jr. winning the Oscar and going up there and thanking everybody. So it's like. Every time someone wins, now we have to have this moment of this feel good moment of well, they've worked so hard to get there, you know. What I mean, we're we're gonna make you forget that they're a heel for the next, 
however long, but you know, they're, this is, this is their time to shine. They've won the Oscar, you know, don't play them off the stage yet, you know, whatever the fuck it may be. But, um, yeah, it just, it really bothers me to the fact of, you know, you have to keep that kind of stuff, um, sacred, you know what I mean? And they're not doing that. You know, they're, they're, they just on the whim will do stuff like that. Um, you know, I, for instance, <clears throat> I believe Percy Whitmore is the greatest heel in movie history. Percy Whitmore from the Green Mile. I think he is the greatest heel in the history of cinema. You know what I mean? Because he had absolutely no redeeming, redeemable qualities at all. There is nothing about that man that would make you go, oh, I'd like to be him. You know what I mean? Or I'd like to have a beer with him. Nothing. He was just sniveling, you know, pussy, you know, you know, just took advantage of people. Just every every negative thing you could think about a human being, that's what he was, right? That's what heels should be, right? You, you know, it shouldn't be Percy Whitmore, but he does cool moves, you know, because then all of a sudden, then I want to do stuff like Percy Whitmore, right? See what I'm saying? Like, but we always forget that kind of stuff. Like, they, they think that, you know, I'm going to go out there with a mean face. You know what I mean? I'm going to do some cool moves. I'm going to sell some t-shirts. And then, you know, I may cheat to win at some point. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> That's kind of up in the air, too. So, it's it's just all half-assed. Well, when you – that that last little part there, when you mentioned that about how the going I, – what I would refer to as going through the motions of being a heel. Uh, I – I suppose the credit or blame, how you want to view it, I I would give to uh, Justin Credible. He was the first one I saw do this. He had a T-shirt. I believe this was during his time with ECW. He had a T-shirt made that simply said, I hate this town. Because it, it is a bit of a trope in professional wrestling that wherever you are, you hate that town if you're a heel. Yeah. And having it emblazoned on a T-shirt as he walked out just kind of screamed it to me. He said, oh, in case you didn't know, I'm the bad guy. Right, right. I'm going to hate this town. Um, and r- rather than by anything he does or, you know, letting the audience know who, th- who he is through his actions, you know, it's just kind of like, oh, hey, here's the T-shirt. Now you know, you know, here's what you're supposed to do. Right. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, just incredible. I mean, I always looked at him as kind of the – because he was, he was kind of click adjacent. You know what I mean? Like he was kind of – he hung out with them. You know, and you know, but like he—he he really wasn't. He's not—he's not quoted as a member of the clique, but he hung out with those guys quite a bit. So when he went to ECW, you know, he—he he worked. He was the closest ECW had to a Shawn Michaels or a Triple H, in that sense, or a Razor, even Scott Hall in that point. You know, so like to me, I always found that connection. But ECW was so, you know, they had good guys and bad guys, you know, but it was very gray area with them too. You know. All right. Um, would it be fair to say that WWE and maybe professional wrestling in general has has kind of caused this problem to a degree for themselves because the and I'm going to use the term kayfabe the existence of it seems to fade in and out when it's necessary or whenever they seem to want to. Uh, the you know I well I'll, for instance. Um, I watched, I believe it was earlier today on YouTube, WWE program. Bobby Lashley was on promoting his match. And during the course of the interview, he mentioned how when he and Drew, or uh, he was already in WWE when Drew was having his tryout. And just a story about how they went out to a, you know, Drew and uh, Seamus snuck into a bar and and told them they were actually WWE talent at the time. And, And, you know, these kind of personal stories that indicated our relationship and, and for someone like me who I'm wanting to see these guys kill each other later on today, I'm not interested in hearing this great, you know, but it was on WWE. It was a YouTube show, but it was WWE programming. And so the kind of kayfabe that I miss is even though I understand the reality of professional wrestling, yeah. I don't want to hear those things on the day of WrestleMania. This is WrestleMania Saturday as we record this, by the way. And, and it takes away from my anticipation for the WWE Championship match, which to me as a fan is a huge deal. 
Yeah, and that's and that's part of their problem too. Is like we say, some things translate to rest, some things translate to wrestling, some things don't. The thing that doesn't really, in my opinion, translate to wrestling is these really intricate backstories. You understand? Like with the Marvel universe, with the MCU, you know, you could pick any character, and I could tell you, you know, a ton about their backstory. You know, and they have movies and books, and you know, there's so much. But wrestling's not that way. Wrestling is boiled down to its simplest form in most cases. Um, are there elements of, of long-term storytelling? Absolutely. Are there elements of, um, you know, like situational kind of thing? Like Triple H wearing the white boots. You know, you know it's a big deal when he wears the white boots because he only wears them in really big matches. Um, but like um, what you're talking about, with that, that's them trying to create this intricate backstory that that television writers believe that they need to to establish characters. But all, all we really want to see, that's a good guy, that's a bad guy. It's good versus evil. It's God versus the devil. Bing bang boom, give me the match. You know what I mean? Is the devil going to triumph this time? And then that's something too. The movie, the movie industry. Um. If if you watch the movie, they have a, a code of conduct within the movie industry too, where a good most of the time prevails. You understand? Like in every movie, you know, eventually the good guy is going to win, right? Yes, there's movies where the bad guy, uh, you know, gets his like the movie Seven. You know what I mean? <laughs> With Kevin Spacey and you know yes. what, what's in the box? Yes. What's in the box? But I mean. That's that's few and far between, but for the most part, as an industry, they decide, hey, we're going to present the good guys winning. You know what I mean? Same thing with professional wrestling. It, it, eventually, it's got to be the good guy triumphs because what's the story otherwise? You understand? Do we do we go watch Rocky to get him beat? You know what I mean? Like even though Rocky lost the first one, he it was he wasn't even supposed to be there, right? And the fact that he lasted with a champion was a, a victory enough. Right, it gave him credibility. Exactly. And then the second one, he ended up beating Apollo. And then the third one, we got Clubber Lang, and we thought there's no way Rocky can beat Clubber Lang. He's so you know, and, that, and it has to be a situation where you go, oh my God, they he can't do it. He can't overcome this. You know, this guy's too strong, this guy's too big, this guy's too whatever. He can't beat him. You know, he's got to be the underdog. All right. I, I guess there there's something we've alluded to and we and we haven't, at least I haven't directly addressed what it is. I've mentioned my criticism toward the creative aspect of WWE, and I would include AEW among others. Um, and it is this concept that has gained some popularity among professional wrestlers that the concept of heel versus babyface is now passe and my and i would kind of cite i would let, let me turn to the movies what is in you know when movies theaters were open in 2019 we had avengers endgame you know we've mentioned comics before clearly defined heels clearly defined baby faces the audience was behind the avengers and trying to right the wrongs of that were done by thanos and getting to him in the end and undoing all those things and it built to a climactic battle you know, just an epic battle we all you know we waited to hear avengers assemble as simple as that little phrase is that was like a big deal when i heard that and just a huge battle and clearly good winning out in the end I don't understand how you can see the all-time box office record and then say, on the other hand, that audiences now, they've moved past good guy, bad guy, heel, baby face. Clearly, they've not in the case of that box office smash. So how can you say that this that concept, why well, that wouldn't work in professional wrestling? Yeah, and that's kind of been my, my argument for this generation. They're always like, Oh, professional wrestling's for everyone. You can do whatever you want. You can be whatever you want. It's all it's all entertainment. It's all show. It's all this. It's all that. And I sit there and go, okay, well, I want good versus evil in a sports-based reality. And they go, oh, no, I don't believe that anymore. Well, motherfucker, you just said <laughs> anything can happen. Well, that's, that's what I want to happen. In your way, my way doesn't hurt your way, but your way definitely hurts my way. You understand? Um, and back to the Avengers thing. The Avengers, that that moment is one of the greatest moments 
in movie history too because like I was in the theater too and I, I get goosebumps kind of talking about it because it was so cool to finally see that them all come together like that right and then when Cap got the hammer oh my god the roof right. went off all right something that was never supposed to happen never supposed to happen and here's another thing about Captain America not only is heel baby supposed to be passe but um, the white knee baby face, the the eternally good baby face, that's supposed to be passe too. But here we have Captain America, who's, you know, arguably the greatest Avenger. You know what I mean? Yeah, number one, the number one Avenger for sure. But he was he was arguably, you know, obviously his trilogy did the best as far as the trilogies go, as far as uh, critically and box office wise. Um. So, yeah, I mean, like that white me baby face thing, all that stuff still works if you know how to do it. <laughs> and that's where we, where the problem lies within because a lot of people just, they don't understand that concept and they don't know how to bring it to life. So to them, it's, you know, they say that we're lazy because we do things a certain way, but they're the ones that are lazy because they're not learning how to actually wrestle. They're not learning how to actually work. And, and do these things like we've learned how to do for the past. Like, I've spent my entire adult life learning how to do this. It's very disrespectful to think that someone three, four, five years in the business, <laughs> you know what I mean, uh, can sit there and say, well, uh, none of that stuff works anymore. Motherfucker, you haven't been around to know what works. You know what I mean? Like, I know what worked 20 years ago, and I know what works today. So who's got, who's got, a, better, who's got a better understanding of professional wrestling, you or I? All right, I guess, yeah, and I do like the way you say learn how to wrestle because I know just in talking with you over time, I know that, uh, and I want the non-wrestling members of the audience to understand that when he uses terms like learn how to wrestle, he's not talking about learning how to properly apply a top wrist lock. Uh, you, I, like you use the term work. Yeah. I, I like that. When you say learn how to work, um, I think it's one of those wrestling shorthand terms that, uh, a non-wrestler audience may miss that I've come to appreciate a great deal more. When I, I used to hear people say, learn how to wrestle. Yeah. And I used to think, well, he knows how to execute a body slam or whatever you want to talk about. But there's so much more to it. And I guess one of the things, I'm going to quickly get in a little opinion here. When I hear this uh, heel and baby face and it can be anything and you can do anything, what I'm wondering is, well, why do I want to why, why do I want to buy a ticket to watch you do just anything? And I want to try to here I want to try to create an analogy. Um, MMA became popular over the recent years, and for some reason there was some kind of criticism. MMA fans would criticize wrestling fans. They'll go, you can't be an MMA fan. And I think it mostly sprung up around Brock Lesnar's involvement with the UFC. And I heard a lot of those things, and I have never been a fan of MMA. And there's a very simple reason I've thought about it, why I don't really care for it, and why I'm a fan of professional wrestling, is because I have no particular interest in the outcome of any of their fights. It's one guy says, I'm going to kick your ass. And then another guy who looks, you know, just as mean, looks back at him, no, 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 I'm going to kick your ass. That's pretty much it. And I have no particular interest outside of Brock Lesnar's involvement. I will admit, I did kind of sneak a peek at some of his things. And I, I will mention, he cut one of my favorite promos ever cut was actually after a match and an the MMA. Budweiser, the Budweiser thing. Yeah, the Budweiser thing. It was my, I thought it was the best promo of his career. <laughs> That's a um, nice I'm going to let you speak on that as why, as... I'm looking at it from the as always from the fan perspective. If you if the heel versus babyface doesn't matter, why do I care who wins? Why do I care about watching this match? Yeah, and that's what. I'm, and you know, like I said before, like nowadays in professional wrestling, they're trying to create. Uh, they're trying to create each wrestler as a as as its own brand. Like each wrestler is the New York Knicks, or each wrestler is you know, the Green Bay Packers. And, like, they're thinking, well, there's people that love the Packers and there's people that hate the Packers. Well, that kind of depends on where you are, doesn't it? You know what I mean? So, like, at, at the end of the day, if you're in Green Bay, you know, majority-wise, you know, they're going to be the baby faces. And that's what I think they don't understand. You have to go um, with the broad term of, you know, this is a baby face, this is a heel, this guy needs to be loved, this, not, this guy needs to be hated, and everything we do on our program – 
in our matches on our television needs to be heading in the in those directions. We don't need to have um, these wishy washy, lukewarm, you know, situations like we had with, like you said, with Bobby Lashley, um, you know using everything he could to get the title match and gets the title match and all of a sudden it's always oh, 16 years he's been working for this no recently he just you know right he, he cut a deal with the Miz he it was underhanded he had MVP conniving and doing things backstage mm-hmm. very almost like a video game segment where MVP's talking to right. uh, the Miz etc and so forth and then you just did away with all that you know because I view Bobby Lashley is a very credible heel. You know, they portrayed him up to that point. He's a juggernaut. He's, I mean, and I like watching him in that role, and I thought he, I believe he's done a good job in it. Yeah. And uh, it just, it frustrates me as a member of the audience when I hear them just quickly, well, yeah, forget all that now. Now it's a great achievement. You know, 16 years, what a great achievement for his career. He's patiently, you know, diligently worked to achieve this. Um, And, one of, well, let's go into something else. Uh, one of the aspects of kind of the passe references to wrestling, one of those things is that in some instances I've seen, we've talked about match structure. Mm-hmm. And I've seen instances where I've seen that go away, so to speak. Completely. When I look at the movies, m- movies generally, most popular movies have a three-act structure. Yeah. And there are people who... You know, who can very easily tell you during the movie, here's where we move from act one to act two because this, when this event happens, the protagonist does this, then we move from act one to act two. Yeah. And those sorts of things, in much the same way, wrestling matches and the cards and everything has a structure. But I hear people, you know, it's like, well, that kind of stuff, that's kind of passe, that's old hat. Do you want to speak on that? Yeah, I mean, storytelling doesn't change. You understand? Like you said, a movie has three acts. For a reason, you know what I mean? Because that's what we've, you know, determined that that's the best way to tell a story within the comics. Same thing with wrestling. In wrestling, we have, we basically have three acts too. It's called a shine, a heat, and a comeback and finish. Same thing with the movies. The first act is, you know, you're you're establishing your baby faces and your heels and what's going on, blah, blah, blah. And eventually the heel um, takes an advantage and the baby face is left with an insurmountable you know, task or challenge. Um, you know, I recently just watched um, the Hobbit trilogy, right? And like Smog the the dragon, yes. right? He looked almost, he looked unbeatable. Like how, how are they going to get over on this? But eventually they did, right? So, I mean, there's, there, and that's, that's the, that's the beauty of storytelling. How can they? You know what I mean? Same thing with a wrestling match, you know? It, it needs to look like that baby face is in such jeopardy he's going to lose this match, then all of a sudden here comes that comeback. You know what I mean? And that's where your finish is. Same thing with a movie finish. You know, it, it all has to do, it all has to move towards a crescendo. And a lot of people don't even understand that concept. So, like you said, they just throw structure out the window, and they basically just go out there and, and just take turns doing moves to each other. You know, I, right. just, I just watched Johnny Gargano and... Uh, Bronson Reed, I like Bronson Reed a lot, but Jesus Christ! I mean, they literally everything was a reversal, and everything was big move kick out. You understand? Like, there's no if if this is the first time I've ever touched you, this is the first time I've ever wrestled you, and I can reverse everything you did. That makes absolutely no sense. the The whole point of reversals was towards if me and you had a wrestling program for eight weeks and we wrestled all the time in those eight weeks and you know we get to that last match and i go for my finish and you reverse and you go for your finish and i reverse you and you see what i'm saying we we've we've established that because we've we've been beaten with those moves before so we know what they look like and feel like so we don't you see what i'm saying there, there's a reasoning behind there's supposed to be a reasoning behind everything we do and now they don't even have a reason to wrestle all right i guess and i try to remind myself to speak for those who aren't um, inside pro, pro wrestling, so to speak, because I I'm a I'm a member of the audience, and I guess the way to demonstrate this is the criticism I often heard. Let me just deal with John Cena. That's what I'm trying to get to. John Cena, uh, we talked about one of the things was the babyface making a comeback. Well, I think no babyface has ever had a more often criticized comeback 
than John Cena, the often mentored five moves of doom. And and everyone says that. But for all the criticisms that I heard leveled at him, I constantly saw him as as much as people criticize him, I saw the reaction from the audience. Whatever you want to say about it, they were into what he was doing. I, I was just talking about this last night at the show because um, I, I was at WrestleMania uh, 31 in California, right? Yes. I think it's 31. San Francisco. San, well, yeah, San Francisco. Well, Santa Clara, but yes. Yeah, yeah, That That stadium, my, my yes. beloved the 40, nine, the 49ers The home. 49ers stadium that I love so much. Anyway, so I, I was there, and like I said, when, um, when John Cena came out against Rusev, that entire place booed John Cena out of the building. You know, 75,000 people booing the hell out of John Cena. Right, but when that three count happened, and he won, they lost their shit. You know what I mean? It it was one of the biggest pops of the night because, and that's what I said. Okay, yeah, they boom on the entrance, but listen to him on the finish. He always gets them on the finish. You know what I mean? They're they're not upset that he fucking won. You know what I mean? They may like ah oh, boo, uh, but yeah. If Cena wins, we riot. Yeah, yeah, stuff like that. It but never I mean, happened. Never happened. But it. it it probably would have happened with the RVD well, one. That, 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 that made, was well, the only one. I wouldn't have tested that one on that. I wouldn't have tested that one either. But, yeah, um, and that's what I'm saying. Like, he, you know, it all, and he's he's another one of those. He's a white meat baby face. Like, you know, more make-a-wishes than, than anybody in history and, you know, all that kind of thing. And that's the kind of thing he talks about. Like, why would I turn heel, you know, uh, when you already boo me, so you can cheer me, that doesn't make any sense. You know, boo me if you want to boo me. I don't care. I'm going to be the same person. And that's a beautiful – that's one of the, the most unique things about him is because they, they took that route with him said, no, 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 he's going to be this, and we're going to see what happens. So I, I was perfectly fine with him never, ever turning heel. All right. Well, my, my point I want to try to make to kind of finish up on, on this aspect is, you know, we're talking about movies. We're talking about involving the audience. And we've talked about Cena and the whole let's go Cena, Cena sucks, and all that made about it. And when his music would hit, you know, people, you know, invented lyrics to his song, John Cena sucks, and all that stuff. And all that's great. But like you, I attended a WrestleMania or two, and for all the criticism I heard leveled, when he would come out, there were a couple, I've been to three, and on those two occasions, I sat down in my seat, and I just wanted to watch everyone else. And because he has... The, the the placement of John Cena and his reaction from the audience has always fascinated me. And I just sat and looked around and watched. And regardless of whether they were booing or cheering or doing something, everyone reacted. That is very, and let me be honest, there are very few uh, performers who can say that. John Cena connected with people positively or negatively. You cared. When he came out, you cared. Every time he cut a promo, people cared. When he if he did the same moves in the same order too many times, people cared. And when he won or lost, people cared. Yep. And that's and that's a beautiful point to the fact of so <clears throat> um John Cena, like you said, you know, it's not l- love and hate are not opposites. Hate is not the opposite of love, and love not the opposite of hate in professional wrestling. Indifference. Right. Silence is the enemy. Silence is the enemy. Love and hate are almost the same. Yes, they may be on due ends of the spectrum, but they're still the same emotional reaction, right? So being indifferent to somebody, that is the ultimate slap in the face, right? Just because you physically hate somebody. Like when people talk about X-Pac heat, you know what I mean? Because, like, when people, when he come out, people go, oh, and groan. You know what I mean? But, like, at the same time, you know, I don't think the ratings dipped when he came out. You know what I mean? I think that, you know, I think he actually, he had heat. Well, I mean, what do you, he's a heel. What do you want him to do? Of course he's going to have you. You're not supposed to like him. You're supposed to be, you want to see him get his face punched in, the little weasel. That kind of <laughs> Right. Uh, someone who compels you to watch as opposed to uh, just as someone who, may have been guilty of this from time to time. There may or may not be professional wrestlers who, when I'm watching back a recording of a show, say I've got my DVR and I'm watching a recording, there are certain individuals who I've learned over time that they are fast forward. When I see them come out, my hand reaches for the fast forward button to move to something else. And that's exactly what you don't want. You want to involve the audience in what you're, the story you're trying to tell. Yeah, even if you love them or you hate them, you want to see where that story goes. Yeah, you know, pretty much. So here we are, 
<laughs> we're way over time, but that's okay because we're not dead set. We're never going to be exactly 30 minutes. We're going to be a little over most of the time. So thank you uh, for the golden boy, Greg Anthony, and my co-host, the Marvel, <laughs> yes. Mark Tipton. Thank you and goodbye.